Hello all and welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another 10 Amazing Florida Facts. For this video, my inspiration is the book Florida in the Making. Published in 1926, the book offers a fascinating look at the entire state, but today I want to focus on 10 aspects of Florida that were or grew to be important to the state's tourism industry. Written by Frank Stockbridge and John Holliday, the 414-page illustrated volume is an early guidebook for business in the Sunshine State. As such, it's rather bullish on Florida's outlook as it details the unprecedented growth of agriculture, mining, industry, transportation, and recreational amenities. Of course, the book was written prior to the coming Great Depression, the subsequent World War, and even before the devastating Okeechobee hurricane of 1928 that claimed the lives of at least 2,500 Floridians. This video contains quotes from 10 subjects and my quick comments. I'll show photos from the book as well as many early images and a few of my photos. Since Stingray Tom's Florida is all about the history of tourism, the subjects are either connected to tourism in 1926 or would soon be. While it may be a surprise to some, industries such as agriculture, mining, and fisheries grew to be associated with tourism, especially in the 1950s. So join me as I take a look at Florida in the Making. Enjoy! In the forward of Florida in the making, then Governor John Martin writes, The sun of Florida's destiny has arisen. No one can read this book without being convinced that all which has yet been done in Florida is but a beginning toward what is to come. Florida in the Making, Part 1. A Visit to Iron Mountain. Quoting from the book, the eastern part of Polk County includes a range of high hills sloping down to the chain of lakes which form the valley of the Kissimmee River. Iron Mountain, at Lake Wales, has an elevation of a little more than 324 feet. It's said to be the highest point within 100 miles of the coast south of New Jersey. It's been developed into an exclusive residential section among whose owners are Edward Bach. The Mountain Lake Clubhouse is one of the finest in the state. Mr. Bach, famous as the former editor of the Ladies' Home Journal, tells in his book, Twice Thirty, of the bird sanctuary, which he's established on the top of Iron Mountain, where the original forest is preserved in its wild state, and every variety of bird known to Florida finds unmolested nesting and resting places. While not the highest point on the Florida peninsula, Iron Mountain comes close and is the home to both an extraordinary private development as well as a remarkable public one. Only a few years after Florida in the Making's publication date, Edward Bach opened the public Mountain Lake Sanctuary, with its centerpiece being the unique Carillon Tower. Known today as Bach Tower Gardens, it's one of the most famous attractions in the state and was a marvel at the time, especially considering it was constructed just prior to the Great Depression. The influence of Bach not only made his garden sanctuary famous throughout the country, but it got President Calvin Coolidge to visit and preside over the grand opening in February 1929, just a few days prior to the end of his term in office. Coolidge wasn't the first sitting president to visit Florida, by the way. That honor goes to Chester Arthur, who it's believed visited Reedy Creek outside of Orlando in the 1880s in order to go fishing. People like to point out that the Walt Disney Company eventually bought that property. So in a way, did Arthur become the first president to visit Disney World? Florida in the Making Part 2 Next, on to Daytona Beach. Again from the book, This country, along the Halifax River, the inlet that separates the sea beaches from the mainland, has been the mecca of northern snow dodgers since the early 1870s. 
Now, Daytona Beach attracts thousands who stay through the winter to enjoy the combination of balmy climate, wonderful surf bathing, and the cultural atmosphere created by the largest open forum in the world. The slope of the land is so gradual that the outgoing tide leaves exposed a breach of hard sand. The fine white sand under the pounding of the waves is packed so firmly as to make a perfect roadway for automobiles, and on these broad, straight stretches, it's no uncommon sight to see hundreds, even thousands of motor cars speeding along the water's edge. The 30-mile stretch from Ormond to Daytona is the scene of the fastest motor racing in the world. It's accurate to call the hard-packed sand in Daytona Beach the place where organized auto racing really started. Apart from many speed records set on the white sand, a race course was fashioned using the beach heading north and connecting with the narrow beach road heading south. Completed in 1902, a year before the Ford Motor Company was founded, it was known as the Daytona Beach and Road Course. It wasn't just used in the earliest days, however. It was the main racetrack in the area for NASCAR until the Daytona International Speedway was built in 1959. As is fitting for the small auto racing city, the new speedway, located to the west of town, also changed racing history. Daytona International was the first super speedway and featured heavily banked turns so race cars wouldn't have to slow down. The curves, which are banked up to 31 degrees, changed not only the speed of racing, but the tactics. The new track proved so successful that other super speedways were built and they continue to be a prominent part of several forms of auto and motorcycle racing around the world. Florida in the Making Part 3 The Everglades From Chapter 15 There is but one way to appreciate and understand the Everglades. That is to visit them and see for oneself. Few who have attempted to visualize this region and have afterwards seen it have not changed their preconceived impressions. It is impossible to imagine a perfectly flat expanse of land, millions of acres in extent, so level, so unbroken, so uniform in its profile, and so vast as to present a completely encircling horizon like that of the sea. Yet that is the picture presented by the great level prairie that is the Everglades. So nearly level is the area, and so devoid of surface relief, that the rain which falls upon its surface and the water which overflowed it from Lake Okeechobee spread out in a broad, shallow sheet and could not develop sufficient current or velocity to erode channels for the flow of the water, thus making it necessary for man to provide, in the shape of artificial waterways, that which was omitted by nature, in order that this area might be fit for the uses and convenience of man. The Everglades occupy an area of 2.8 million acres south of Lake Okeechobee. The Everglades Drainage District includes all of the lands comprising 4.8 million acres in 10 counties. Lake Okeechobee is in the heart of this district and constitutes the heart of the Everglades drainage problem. Before drainage operations had reached their present stage, the glades were covered every year for months at a time with water that had overflowed from Okeechobee. There were no human inhabitants except scattering families of Seminole Indians who made their habitations in the remote hammocks or high spots, which became islands in flood time, secure against the intrusion of the white man. So first of all, I've chosen to partly illustrate this section with some remarkable wildlife images. The illustrations are by Walter Weber, one of the National Geographic's longtime illustrators. Weber's work history is a list of the most important nature organizations in the country, including Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History, National Park Service, National Geographic Magazine, National Museum of Natural History, and a painting of an eagle was even used by the Apollo Space Program. I'm sure I'll do a video on his work in Florida one day. This collection graced the January 1949 edition of National Geographic. Regardless of why the massive changes were made to the Everglades throughout the early 20th century, it was the wildlife, such as you see here, that has suffered the most. That the authors of Florida in the Making, in the same breath, could extol the beauty and majesty of the Everglades while saying it's necessary to nearly destroy them for the benefit of big business, is beyond me. Yet the government, big business, 
naturalists, and scientists, as well as the Seminole tribe, continue to discuss further changes to this unique environment, easily the most remarkable in Florida. The Everglades is not only a national park, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, one of only 24 in the entire United States. Florida in the Making, Part 4 Lake Okeechobee and the St. Lucie Canal Within the same chapter, Lake Okeechobee, which is the largest body of fresh water except Lake Michigan, lying within the borders of the United States, has no natural outlet. Its annual overflow, until reclamation measures were resorted to, kept the low country surrounding it in an almost perpetual state of flood. Part of the overflow is now taken care of by a canal which connects the lake with the Caloosahatchee River, which flows to the Gulf. The rest of it will be taken care of by the St. Lucie Drainage Canal, leading to the Atlantic Ocean. These and other smaller canals have already lowered the level of Lake Okeechobee. It formerly was 21 feet above sea level, but is now only about 16 feet. The key to the Everglades drainage problem is Lake Okeechobee. Without any natural outlet, this lake could do nothing else but overflow its banks when the annual floodwaters of the Great Kissimmee Valley, draining the hills of the Florida Highlands, poured into it. So the principal unit of the program is the St. Lucie Canal, extending from the east side of the lake to the St. Lucie River, which empties into the Atlantic at Stewart. This canal is 25 miles long, it's about 200 feet wide, and when completed will have a depth of 10 to 12 feet. The canal has been carefully calculated to carry off 85% of the flood water. People who live around the Big O, as Okeechobee is sometimes called, know that it's inextricably linked to the Everglades, even though over 100 years of human effort has pretty much tried to separate the two. By the time Florida in the Making was written, Okeechobee was well on its way to being a real lake, not just a massive shallow pool of fresh water that for tens of thousands of years would imperceptibly merge into the glades. While the book detailed the work that was done to fashion a shoreline where none existed, and to create canals to channel what was thought as an excess of water, it would take the Okeechobee hurricane of 1928 to shift the process into overdrive. While some 2,500 Floridians are considered to have died, countless others went missing. The large majority of the victims were black farmers and sugarcane laborers. When the dead were collected, the black victims were separated and placed in the mass graves. Segregation was enforced even in the midst of one of the country's worst disasters. After 1928, the efforts to control the flow of water out of Okeechobee increased significantly. The dike that surrounds 95% of the lake as well as the St. Lucie waterway were completed. Massive flood control stations and more canals helped change Okeechobee into a normal lake and drain as much of the glades as was allowed, so crops could be grown in the muck that is known as Florida's black gold. Lake Okeechobee continues to be a destination for freshwater anglers from all over the world. While that's probably its biggest claim to fame, thousands of other people use it for boating and hike or cycle on its dikes. Many more just drive to the lake so they can prove to themselves that it's impossible to see the other side. Florida in the Making, Part 5. Sugar Production and Clewiston. From the book. According to the last published agricultural census of Florida for the year 1924, there were 16,000 acres under cultivation in sugar cane in Florida. The production of this cane was nearly 2 million gallons of syrup, worth around a dollar a gallon. Every part of Florida grows sugar cane, but up to the beginning of 1926, the amount of sugar produced in Florida has been negligible. A large proportion of the farmers have their own syrup mills for grinding the cane and boiling the juice down to syrup. The greatest sugar experts in the world are staking millions of dollars upon the belief that this is precisely Florida's destiny. They found soil which produced cane profusely and found that this cane contained a high percentage of sugar. The book continues with the plans to create the largest sugar mill in the world as well as a factory for the manufacture of Celotex, a building material produced from the waste of sugar production. 
having developed their plans thus far, they realized that the mill and factory would eventually employ 5,000 hands. Accordingly, a large tract of land was purchased, landscape artists were employed to lay out a city upon it, and simultaneously the city of Cluiston, where the workers can live in comfort and where all modern urban facilities for business, independent and pleasant and helpful living conditions will be provided, is being constructed on the shores of Lake Okeechobee. So Cluiston is a planned city. To this day, thousands of its residents work in the sugar industry. Incorporated in 1925, just as Florida in the Making was being printed, the settlement of the town had only begun five years before. As the home of U.S. Sugar Corporation and the world's largest sugar processing plant, Cluiston would become America's sweetest town. Much of the refined sugar produced in the United States still comes from Cluiston, U.S. Sugar, and the 360 square miles or 930 square kilometers it farms around Lake Okeechobee. The Sugar House was once the name of the U.S. Sugar's massive plant. An unlikely attraction, it was promoted by the company through advertisements, postcards, and brochures, like others promoting attractions along Florida's Orange Blossom Trail. Tours of the facility discuss planting and harvesting sugarcane, as well as the process to take what is essentially a grass and turn the sugary water hidden inside into refined white sugar. By the way, Solitex doesn't appear to be made anymore, but the waste plant fibers created out of cane processing, known as Bag S, found a new life in the recycled products market when fashioned in new paper products from plates to boxes to napkins. It has also been used as a biofuel and is often used to power the cane processing plants themselves. Florida in the Making Part 6 Tarpon Springs and the Sponge Industry Continuing on with agriculture. Not to be overlooked in any consideration of Florida's marine resources are the sponge beds of the Gulf of Mexico. Two sponge fleets owned and operated entirely by Greeks operated in the Gulf. One fleet has Key West as its home port. The other, and larger, makes its headquarters at Tarpon Springs, where the largest and most important sponge market in the U.S. is maintained. Tarpon Springs is built around a charming lagoon which has been spoken of as the most beautiful body of water in Florida. The waters of the Gulf are the source of the world's largest supply of sponges, which are gathered by the fleets four times a year for a three-month cruise. Most of them are brought up by divers who go overboard in full diving armor and gather these curious marine growths at depths as great as 150 feet. The sponge boats are themselves of Mediterranean design, gaily painted, and until recent years were equipped with brilliantly colored lateen sails. Tarpon Springs has a further claim to fame in that it is the home of George Innes Jr., the famous artist whose landscapes are regarded as equaling in quality and atmosphere the work of his even more famous father. Practically all of Mr. Innes's best-known canvases were painted in the vicinity of Tarpon Springs, and his mural paintings, which decorate the walls of one of the town's churches, attracts thousands of art lovers every year. In a way, Tarpon is unique in Florida. It's probably the only community that has a distinct cultural association. Of course, that'd be its Greek connection. While today only about 12% of the city report having Greek ancestry, many of Tarpon's cultural events and nearly all of its tourism are directly related to the Greek heritage and the sponge industry, an industry that nearly died off in 1947 due to massive red tide algae bloom. While the sponging recovered, it never grew to the level it had been in the first 40 years of the 20th century. George Innes Jr. and his paintings continue to remain popular, however. The church where several of his most important works reside is the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tarpon Springs, the oldest church in the city. Recent major renovations to the church building have restored the structure and the Innes paintings are back in their places. Florida in the Making, Part 7, Rollins College in Winter Park. Once again, quoting from the book, 
Rollins College was established in 1885 through the influence of the General Congregational Association of Florida and with the aid of a gift of $114,000 made by the citizens of Winter Park and a gift of $50,000 by Alonzo Rollins. Its campus is beautifully situated on the shore of Lake Virginia. It's co-educational with a student body of fewer than 300. The ideal of Rollins is that of the small college devoted to the study of the humanities. In 1940, Rollins would add to its campus a museum as important as it was unusual. The Beale Maltby Shell Museum likely held the largest private shell collection in the world. Opening with an estimated 70,000 shells, the collection would continue to grow and 40 years later would contain nearly 2 million from around the world. Today, Rollins continues to be an important private liberal arts college with a full-time student body of about 3,000. While it's not in the average tourist must-see list, its beautiful campus is easily accessible, contains many fine architectural buildings, and has an excellent art museum. It sits in close proximity to Winter Park's Park Avenue and its many interesting shops and restaurants. It's also close to the Winter Park Scenic Boat Tour that provides views of Rollins from Lake Virginia. Florida in the Making, Part 8. A Look at Phosphate Mining. From the book. Nearly half of the world's supply of phosphate is dug from Polk County's soil. Phosphate, though classed as a mineral, owes its value to the fossilized bones of prehistoric sea animals which were deposited upon the bed of an ocean when the Florida Peninsula was still underwater countless geologic ages ago. All that remains of these vanished creatures is the phosphorus, which constitutes so large a proportion of all animal matter. The bones themselves have long vanished, although here and there in the process of mining, remains of huge skeletons are unearthed. The rock thus formed is impregnated with phosphorus, which is one of the three essential elements in the manufacture of fertilizers, the other two being potash and nitrogen. The mines are owned by the great agricultural chemical companies. They lie chiefly to the west of the center of the state, stretching from Bartow to north of Ocala. I know what you're thinking. Sugar production is tourism, maybe, but fertilizer? Let me introduce you to the Phosphate Valley Exposition, a museum that not only told the story of Florida's largest mining concern, but also focused on its Ice Age history and the story of American megafauna when the animals were massive. Open in 1952, Phosphate Valley was an interesting museum that used large paintings, animated dioramas, and life-size sculptures of prehistoric animals to teach what life was like in Florida tens of thousands or even millions of years ago. It featured ground sloths, saber-toothed tigers, giant armadillos, and early whales, as well as the true giants, mastodons and mammoths, all animals that called the ancient peninsula home. Most of the fossils on display were collected in Florida, both in its springs as well as in the phosphate mines. Although today the Phosphate Valley Exposition is only part of Florida's history, its legacy is honored in the small town of Mulberry with the 1986 opening of the Phosphate Museum, a place that tells the same story, albeit in a smaller facility. As can be seen by these photos, the Ice Age animals are present, and there's a massive dragline bucket outside, filled with dredgings from a nearby mine. Within the phosphate-laden soil, visitors can find shark teeth and ancient animal bones to take home. Florida in the Making Part 9 Silver Springs Continuing on from the book, Close to Ocala is one of the great natural marvels of Florida, Silver Springs. This is an almost circular bowl, more than a quarter of a mile in diameter, whose crystal clear waters are so transparent that the smallest objects are visible at a depth of 30 feet or more. Visitors are taken out on the surface of the springs and the adjacent bays and inlets to see water bubbling up from crevices in the lime rock, which forms the bottom of the lake. Silver Springs is said to have the largest flow of any spring in the world, more than 22 million gallons an hour. The iridescent effect as the sunlight is refracted from the bottom is one of the most beautiful sights imaginable. Silver Springs discharges into the Oklawaha River, 
which is navigable all the way from its junction with the St. John's. Silver Springs needs little introduction to people at all familiar with Florida tourism history. Likely the oldest continually operating attraction in the state, it grew to become one of the largest and most popular in the 50s and 60s. Today, the state of Florida operates the site as a state park, effectively saving it as both a valuable natural and cultural resource. In 1926, visitors would be able to take the glass bottom boats to view the remarkable clarity of the water. They could swim in the springs and watch swimming demonstrations. Eventually would come all the additional attractions, including the Jungle Cruise, the Ross Allen Reptile Institute, and Tommy Bartlett's Deer Ranch. But none of that would last. In the past few years, it's been mostly just the glass bottom boats. In a way, it's come full circle. Florida in the Making, Part 10, St. Augustine. Our final quote from the book. The motor tourist may, if he desires, drive from Jacksonville down the beach all the way to a point opposite St. Augustine, or he may go by motorboat through the inland waterway. More likely, however, he will drive over the Dixie Highway or take the Florida East Coast Railroad to America's oldest city, where Ponce de Leon is said to have landed, and where the atmosphere still reminds the visitor that this was a Spanish settlement. The quaint historic city is a haven of peaceful repose. The narrow streets of its older section, lined with houses some 300 years old, the ancient Spanish fort, and the leisurely manner of its inhabitants make a charming background against which the Ponce de Leon Hotel, the first and still the most magnificent, welcomes the peace-seeking visitor. St. Augustine does not boast a large fleet of yachts as to Miami or Palm Beach, but the oldest yacht club in the south is that of St. Augustine, and on the roster are to be found names representing almost every family of wealth for the past 75 years. The old city is renewing its youth. First of all, imagine driving a car the 40 miles or 64 kilometers from Jacksonville to St. Augustine, along the beach. If only we could do that today. Ironically, these paragraphs about St. Augustine don't age well. Though the writers can be excused in that the understanding of past events has grown significantly in the intervening 95 years since the book's publication. Archaeology was in its infancy in 1926, and while it was being practiced in the old city, tales of the past were still the primary source of information. For example, the photo in the book that shows St. Augustine's oldest house attraction states that it was built in 1516, even though St. Augustine was, in fact, founded in 1565. Today, the structure, known officially by the name of former owners, the Gonzalez Alvarez House, is believed to date to 1723. No other structures other than the Castillo de San Marcos date any earlier than that as far as research shows, and so the house is only now on the cusp of reaching its 300th anniversary. Still, that's pretty remarkable. At least the book states that Ponce de Leon is said to have landed at the location of the future city. While it's possible that he landed there, there are several other places along the coast which are considered possible for his first landing on the North American continent. Well, that about wraps it up for another Stingray Tom's Florida video. I hope you enjoyed getting a taste of what the book Florida in the Making was all about. It's an interesting read considering it's 95 years old. Please let me know in the comments if exploring books like this is worthwhile or not. Thanks for watching. If you did enjoy it, please hit the like button, subscribe, and share the video. Stingray Toms, Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.